Hello. I suppose that we are uh, online now. So, uh, good morning to everyone. I'm Antonio Bombelli. I'm the director of the CMCC YAFES division. That's the divisions on the impacts of climate change on ecosystem and their services. And today we will have a webinar presented by Francesca La Rosa that you can see, I suppose, now. Uh, from the CMCC division on uh, risk assessment and adaptation strategy. Uh, the webinar is about uh, mapping innovation, a, a global outlook of climate services. Uh, Francesca, I'm giving a few words about her. Francesca is a PhD student uh, in climate change science and management at Kafoska University. And this is uh, a joint PhD with CMCC. And uh, at CMCC, she works at research under the supervision of uh, uh, Yaroslav Misak in the RAS division that I just mentioned before. Uh, she works on climate services, of course, contributing to um, two European projects, you, Max, and Clara. Clara, indeed, is an um, H2020 project uh, coordinated by CMCC, uh, right to develop uh, 14 types of climate services uh, in different sectors, like agriculture, disasters, disasters, uh, and uh, water management, hydropower, climate predictions, uh, etc. Uh, climate services is quite a recent concept uh, that is raising a continuously uh, increasing interest in the sector of climate science and links research with socioeconomic and uh, uh, also policy implication. Um, and as you know, CMCC. Uh, is uh, uh, a non-profit foundation for addressing uh, uh, with a multi multidisciplinary approach uh, uh, climate change and uh, is its interaction with uh, the environment, uh, the society, the world of business and policy. Uh, CMCC is uh, a network, is uh, a network uh, uh, organized uh, across, uh, distributed uh, through different uh, uh, location uh, in Italy. You can see here uh, the city that are uh, Lecce, Bologna, Capua, Milano, Sassari, Venezia and Viterbo. For example, I work in Viterbo, while Francesca, she is in Venice, Venezia. Uh, the CMCC scientific activities uh, uh, are distributed across eight research divisions which address different aspects of climate science. Uh, that are, for example, modeling, monitoring, predicting the system at different levels, considering impacts, economics, services, policy, and the society. Um, CMCC is also deals also with the outreach activities in addition to scientific publications. There is a, a quite extensive range of uh, outreach activities uh, uh, for communication and uh, education purposes. Um, and I think I can also close with this short introduction of CMCC and we can now move uh, toward this presentation. I warmly invite you to contribute, uh, to actively participate in this uh, uh, webinar, uh, specifically with questions. You can use uh, the webinar system. You should have uh, on your uh, um, right side of your screen, you should have uh, uh, the chat system, um, the, oh, sorry, the uh, a question system. So you can click where a question uh, I see in Italian, I don't know uh, you, uh, if it is an English question, in Italian is a demand. You can click on and uh, write your question. Also during the presentation, I invite you to specify your name, your affiliation and country before to write your question so we can understand the kind of audience. And about the audience, I see there are more than 200 uh, at least registered participants today. Uh, I don't know how many connected, uh, but now we can finally move uh, to the, today's presentation. So I leave the floor to Francesca. Uh, as I just said, uh, Francesca is giving a global outlook uh, uh, of climate services on the basis of uh, a mapping exercise. So 
thanks and please uh, Francesca you can go ahead Thank you, thank you, Antonio, for the introduction. Thank you to CMCC for this opportunity. Indeed, I'm presenting a work which is co-authored by Jaroslav Misiak, Director of the Risk Assessment and Adaptation Strategies Division, as Antonio was saying. The aim of this work is to map the landscape of climate innovation in Europe and beyond uh, by focusing on research on climate services. I will define in a minute what climate services are for those who are not familiar with the concept. We started with an analysis of sociocentric and egocentric bibliographic networks, so understanding how basically research works through a bibliometric approach. And then we were interested in underlying the intrinsic characteristics of co authorship networks and identify the poles of innovation with a specific zone in Europe. We did this through a social network analysis, which more than a theory is relatively a strategy. Finally, we complemented all these findings with a qualitative analysis using content analysis to identify the most relevant topics tackled by authors, analyzing the abstracts of the work. So for those, again, who are not familiar with climate services, uh, they have received quite extensive attention in the past two decades, so 20 years. They have been defined in 2001 in the US as the timely production, translation, and delivery of useful climate data, information, and knowledge. But this definition has been relatively uh, extended towards a more user-centered and um, multidisciplinary approaches. Uh, specifically, we're seeing there are several uh, flagship initiatives initiatives such as the creation of the Global Framework for Climate Services in 2009 and the launch of the European Roadmap for Climate Services in 2015. Broadly speaking, we will define for the context of this presentation, climate services as all the products and tools capable of transforming raw climate data into useful and usable uh, products for a wide variety of users. Users can be uh, very diverse, which poses several challenges, but also opens uh, some opportunities. As I said, we started in this analysis of using a bibliographic approach. Uh, so we launched a query on Scopus database, which is the biggest on earth for collecting publication records across different domains and disciplines. We cross-checked this query uh, using several combination of keywords, but also we cross-checked with the web of science, finding actually significant differences because Scopus has the widest uh, collection of publication records ever. The included documents in this analysis are pure reviewed articles, book chapters, books, conference proceedings, press articles, and reports. Uh, it is important to bear in mind that we haven't included any project deliverables in this sample, and I will come back to this point at the very end of the presentation. After careful data cleaning performed on multiple software, we included in the sample 330 records in distributed across 173 sources. The great majority of articles are co-authored and uh, the period that we are considering is 1980, 2017 indeed, because 2018 is still uh, ongoing. Uh, we have approximately four uh, co-authors uh, per article in the samples. Uh, showing, again, quite some uh, diversity in terms of sources, uh, institutions and countries. As you can appreciate from the bottom part of the slide, so the picture called annual scientific production, climate services research has uh, grown quite extensively, specifically after uh, the launch of the first uh, global initiative, which I was mentioning before, 2009 Global Framework for Climate Services. Uh, the growth is um, presenting a an annual growth rate since 1980 of 12%. Uh, the other vertical line that you see here is again the European Roadmap for Climate Services. Now, through bibliometric analysis, which is indeed um, is, sub part of scientometrics, so is the quantitative assessment of publication records in a given field, we were capable of detecting the most productive authors, the most productive institutions, the most productive countries, and the sources where the majority of articles are published. So on the uh, top of uh, the slides, uh, left hand side, we have uh, the top 20 authors that are publishing for a number of articles on climate services. And as you can appreciate, the great majority of them are actually operating in the European landscape. So the top authors in terms of productivity is Carlo Bontempo from ECMWF, but there are also others such as Hewitt, Metoffis, Douglas Reyes, Lisse, Mason Louis, um, and others such as Bruno Marta 
Bruno Soares, um, and uh, these are only the top 20, but uh, of course they are ranked according to the number of publications that they publish according to our query. But if we move towards the top uh, right hand side of the slide, then we see uh, the ranking of the institutions that are operating in the climate series landscape, where we can actually see still quite a strong presence of the United States with NOAA on top uh, and Columbia University with two research institutes, IRI and the Earth Institute. Matt Hoff is in the UK, is still dominant and ECFWF follows uh, together with University of Leeds and Reading. However, uh, and still, this, this picture is confirmed by the uh, bottom part of the slide, left hand side, where we have countries. They are ranked according to multiple country publication, which is the pink bar, and single country publication, which is the green bar. United States are still quite dominant, and they are mostly publishing domestically. So they are co-authoring with their own, uh, within their own country network. If you compare, for example, United States with Netherlands, you can appreciate definitely the difference between multi-country publication records and single country publication records. Talking about sources instead, the great majority uh, of uh, articles are published in a relatively wide uh, range of uh, different uh, journals. Some of them are very relevant, such as nature climate change in terms of impact factor, of course, uh, climatic change, but also um, uh, but also climate research, climate dynamics. Uh, some of them are brand new, such as Climate Services, which is an open uh, access publication by uh, Elsevier. As I said, we were interested in understanding not only uh, who, uh, say, the, the bibliometric aspects of the sample that we included in the analysis, but also the intrinsic properties behind their co-authorship. Now, this is a picture of the overall network that we are considering, so 1,203 author. Uh, there are here displayed in Fruchterman mode, so it's not circled, but Fruchterman. And as you can already see, this is an indirect graph weighted. So it's indirect because the direction of the relationship between authors is not relevant. It is enough that authors A co-authors with author B for the relations to be in place. And the weights that we're considering here is the number of publication. For the purpose of this presentation, I'm only focusing on co-authorship, but of course, co-citation also deserves quite significant attention. Now the color uh, represent different clusters and uh, the strength of the ties is given by the number of publication and as you can already see by yourself there is a quite a significant central network of 468 authors that are very well connected. We perform the social network analysis to uh, understand the cohesion of the network and we found that this overall network that we are uh, considering is poorly danced, so it's 0.0069, which is definitely loose, and has a degree centrality of 8.56. Uh, now, for those, again, who are not familiar with these uh, statistics, um, there is a quite um, quite broad range of statistics that we could consider in social network analysis. Uh, we're considering here the density, which is the indicator for the general level of connectedness of the graph, which is a ratio uh, given by the number of links and the number of vertices in a fully connected graph. And we're mostly tackling degree centrality, which is again is the number of tie. Uh, a given node, so a given author has, and the between a centrality, so the number of times a node needs a given node to reach another one. Between a centrality in particular, even in the literature, is very well stressed because it represents the extent to which a node facilitates the information flow. Uh, we will focus, uh, we will move from an overall sociocentric co authorship network towards a sociocentric main network. And here is the picture that we have in front of us. So again, the colored one that you saw before is actually zoomed. And we can see that there are 25 subclusters which are weighted on the number of publication records uh, using the Louvain method, which is called in this way uh, because it's a statistical technique developed by a team uh, which was based in Louvain. Uh, it displays an higher density than the full network because the density is actually much higher, 0.026. Six. And we did also an analysis of the popularity of actors, so the degree centrality analysis, finding again that 
most productive author, which is Carlo Bontempo, ACMWF, is also the most uh, popular uh, within this central network, uh, followed by Kumar, Kelly Gistram, and Douglas Reyes in top position. The average is uh, 12, indicators that uh, many authors are still poorly connected. We have 10 clicks, so subgraphs of more than three nodes that are directly connected, uh, one with each other, which is relevant because it means that basically there are uh, sub-networks that are co all together. Now, analyzing again this central network, we moved towards from a sociocentric towards an egocentric network, analyzing the between a centrality. Again, uh, the between a centrality is the extent to which a node facilitates uh, the information flows, and still results confirm what we found from both the bibliometric analysis and the analysis of popularity, finding bon tempo in top position, but also other very connected and relevant authors such as Roger Street, UA. Uh, Douglas Reyes again listed among uh, the central one. Uh, the right hand side of this picture is actually used here for visualization purposes. Imagine that uh, I'm displaying here the full central network of authors, and uh, the green bullet point that you see on top is Carlo Bontempo. Uh, the authors are listed in circular mode, and as you can see, this author itself can connect the great majority, uh, not the great majority, but a wide number of actors within the network, which means that uh, his network, uh, his personal Personal network called egocentric network in the literature is actually very relevant in explaining the intrinsic properties of the sociocentric one. Therefore, we run a specific uh, analysis on the egocentric network, uh, looking at the most productive author and understanding the characteristics of them. And of course, it's much more cohesive than the previous two, because now the density is 0.20 and the degree centrality is 22%. Now, in the analysis of between the centrality is key authors that are listed among the top in the betweenness values that they display, such as Robert uh, Douglas Reyes, Kelly Strom, Bruno Soares, um, Mac Leod, and many others, such as Roger Street, are also the ones that were present in the betweenness centrality of the sociocentric one, which means that basically the dynamic that is happening at the egocentric network level is very, again, very relevant for the sociocentric uh, dimension. As I said, that was not interesting. We were not interested only in the network of uh, individual authors, but also at country level and institutional level. Now, move the country level uh, and focusing again on the main network, not the overall uh, one that you saw at the very beginning, we found 63 countries included. Uh, the size of the nodes, which hopefully you can at least a bit appreciate, are given by their degree. Uh, the degree of countries that we are considering, and given the strength of the nodes, of the, of the nodes and the uh, strengths of the ties, we can definitely conclude that English-speaking countries, such as the United States and United Kingdoms, still confirm themselves to be in the top connectance position, both for between the centralities and degree centrality, followed by Germany, Switzerland, France, and Spain. Now, findings confirm the positioning that was previously found by other climate-related studies, such as uh, uh, water management, but also IPCC network, which is the Corbera et al. paper, 2015, published in Nature Climate Change. And finally, uh, the final paper that I mentioned here is ecosystem services. Unfortunately, we don't have a comparison on climate services because to our knowledge, this is this kind of extensive analysis that is considered multiple statistics uh, uh, is, not, uh, is not fully developed uh, in the literature so far. At the institutional level, definitely we compare degree centrality versus between centrality. This is useful to understand that uh, according to the different statistics that we are considering, then even the ranking at the institutional level can change. So we must be very careful in uh, analyzing the entire situation. So the left hand side of this of this uh, slide shows the degree centrality ranking. And as you can see, Columbia University is very dominant, uh, followed by Met Office, but also University of Oxford, and there are several other uh, several other several other institutions which are both a European level and international level. While if we compare the ranking based on the betweenness centrality, which is basically the right hand side of this slide, we see that the order still confirms the relative the relative 
presence of Columbia Met Office, but also some other Australian institutions are actually very powerful and in general English speaking countries are still in the top position. It's relevant to see that all other actors such as GRX, um, SMHI are present in this network in the top uh, 20 institutions considered in the in the network, but uh, um, but still they will be uh, they will be proved uh, to be crucial even in the project making uh, later on in my presentation. If we focus then on the content, basically, what people are actually talking about when they publish on climate services, we um, perform an analysis based on text mining and again analysis of the abstracts of the content. By the way, the uh, entire analysis so uh, from bibliometrics up to uh, content analysis is performed using R, which is an open source uh, software and is also for visualization purposes combined with Jeffy and Vios Viewer. Um, and here, if we see uh, basically the top keywords in terms of trends over time, we see that there is a quite significant spike. I here highlight again the global framework for climate services. The top one uh, in terms of views is decision making. So basically, the yellow, yellowish line that you see on top of on top of the graph is decision making, which is displaying a uh, dramatic increase over time, uh, followed by forecasting, uh, followed by risk assessment and uh, climate prediction, climate modeling. But we were not satisfied, let's say, looking only at the evolution of uh, the top uh, keywords. So we run a separate clusterized analysis on abstracts again and top keywords. And now you can appreciate, basically, considering only the period 2010, 2017, how climate services are moving towards a user-centered adaptation focused um, topics and uh, general broad topics because if you see for example the most ancient let's call it like that uh, top keywords are mostly related to emissions mitigations and different sectors moving towards then technicalities such as the modeling the ensemble variabilities and some key uh, some key variables and converging finally in very recent times towards climate information user needs credibility and users opportunity and seasonal climate if instead we run the same analysis but over time by looking at the density of clusters that we analyze we can really see how basically some keywords are popping up as very relevant a sector level farmer is the work that is driving mostly uh, together with water management but definitely we can see how this conversion is going from mitigation uh, from mitigation sectors towards a more adaptation and user center dynamic which is the yellow and red part at the center of the of the of the picture looking instead of those who are the pose of innovation in europe together with yaro we run then in analysis looking at a sample of projects that are collecting through cordis database and era for climate services uh, this uh, sample is composed by 35 research projects that are all funded uh, under the Horizon 2020 uh, called SC501-2016-2017 and uh, Era for Climate Services 2016-2017. We analyze the competitiveness between NATS2 regions and all the partners involved in the projects that won these two calls. And as you can see, the pose of innovation is actually quite uh, significant in the sense that Barcelona, Paris, Madrid, Rome, Vienna, and Stockholm are the, definitely the pools that are driving uh, that are driving uh, innovation in Europe uh, when we talk about climate services. The colors is the degree centrality within these networks, and the size of the nodes is instead the um, eigenvector centrality. Um, then we compare with uh, their connectedness in terms of how these partners are interacting, and uh, here there are the acronyms of the institutions that are taking place in this call, uh, showing definitely that uh, the network is very well connected, but still a relatively small amount of partners are involved in innovation in climate services. Now, to uh, conclude and leave space to 
question. Um, we found basically uh, throughout this overall mapping at both global and European scale that the interest in climate services has significantly increased over time since 1980, showing again an annual growth rate in publication of 12%. There are multiple actors that are taking place and multiple disciplines uh, because again there are authors that are uh, writing in earth and planetary sciences but also in environmental sciences and social sciences, finance and economics since mostly 2010 to 2009. A small sample of individual scholars based on our uh, bibliographic analysis presents high, um, high popularity, high betweenness, and these results are confirmed also by the social network analysis. English speaking and Western continental EU countries are dominant in shaping the information flow. Uh, and this is something that we saw through the separate statistical techniques that we use, but also uh, through the analysis of the innovation pools in Europe with the sample of projects uh, that were awarded uh, for working in climate service. The dynamic content analysis of AFSTRA reveals that climate services are actually progressive, shifting the attention towards adaptation factors and definitely user-centered perspectives. So putting users at the center of their discussions, while the analysis for project at the EU level demonstrate that still, despite quite a significant effort in investment in climate services, there is a clear Northwest versus Southeast climate knowledge divide in the EU. So this should be uh, tackled over time with a small cluster of organization that are still dominating the knowledge flow and innovation across Europe. Finally, our analysis, uh, uh, we use the innovation score index of the European Commission to compare uh, the dominant regions for project, classifying them according to their innovation scoreboard. And we found that there is a moderate link between innovation and competitiveness environment and the intensity of climate innovation. Still, we are in a qualitative stage, so we will perform a definitely more robust quantitative analysis. But I guess that uh, um, all your comments and suggestions and reaction will be helpful in understanding the direction. Please drop me an email if you have, again, any reaction and feedbacks. Uh, at this stage, everything is mostly welcome. As I said at the beginning, this is a work in progress. And uh, thank you for your attention. OK, I have to switch on my webcam. Voila, I hope so. OK. Now you can see me again. So thanks, Francesca, for this interesting and uh, innovative presentation. At least the, the topic is uh, quite uh, new. Uh, I can check now that uh, 110 people are now connected. So congratulations for the wide audience. And uh, I, I would think that I, the, I work like the, this one was uh, really missing because uh, as far as I know, it isn't uh, still available such a complete uh, catalog of climate services uh, uh, in the way you addressed it. So maybe I can start with the first question uh, from my side and then check uh, other question. Um, it's rather a curiosity because from, from your talk, uh, the, the growing interest on climate services uh, uh, in the last decades is uh, really evident. And I believe uh, this is because uh, um, this is really a great opportunity to link science with uh, uh, application. But if you have other consideration, uh, you're free. But my question is that whether, let's say, despite this big interest, I see that the number of main authors and leading organization is um, quite limited. So do you think this is uh, because uh, this is uh, still a young topic? or for other reasons like, uh, for example, um, probably this sector is quite different from the classical um, climate change research uh, sector or because uh, scientists often have, have still difficulties to link with the policy community or for any other, other reasons. Well, thank you. I must say that um, climate, since climate services are quite, as I said at the beginning, a broad uh, topic, um, they need really from the development 
stage. So from the technical side, uh, they need quite some some efforts. So there are a bunch of scientists that are really uh, putting attention on how to develop, for example, seasonal forecast. Uh, there is attention from ECM, WF, Copernicus Climate Change Service at the moment. So they are writing on the technical scientific side. And now there are some actors which are definitely not a huge uh, number in terms of quantity, but they are capable of connecting these two sides of science and policy, moving towards not only uh, the technicalities, but also so the scientific uh, background, but also towards a more user-centered perspective. So definitely it is a young topic that uh, needs uh, more and more actors to be involved. But uh, I must say that the effort that we see, even the cluster, even if the cluster of, of, of voters is relatively limited, is quite significant in bridging this knowledge gap between science and policy making. So hopefully over time, there will be uh, more heterogeneity, uh, but, um, but the authors that are most productive and in general most connective so that they are driving the information flows are also the ones that in terms of content are capable of bridging science and policy making passing through markets. So definitely, hopefully, we should uh, offer a higher heterogeneity, but uh, I believe that we are on the right track at the moment. Thanks, Francesca. So I see quite a, a lot of questions, so I will try to to uh, turn them to you. Let's say the first one uh, are from, actually, he wrote uh, two different questions from Gregor Vulturius, I'm sorry for the pronunciation, from SEI, I suppose from Sweden, if it is uh, the Stockholm Environmental Institute, uh, I think. Um, so his question is, uh, um, is your analysis limited to academic, academic research or are private sector uh, or like insurance also considered? And then he also have a sort of hypothesis uh, when you about you showed that this shift from mitigation to adaptation in the literature. Uh, he is arguing that that uh, could be uh, caused by the com commercialization of mitigation services. What do you think? So these are actually two questions. I don't know if uh, you, okay. Please. Well, um, the first point that I actually missed, uh, I mentioned at the very beginning, but then I did not elaborate at the very end. We are not considering here the project deliverables, which is actually quite relevant because given the relatively new uh, given the relatively novelty of the topic, there are several projects ongoing or just finished that publish a relatively fair amount of project deliverables which are really contributing to the literature. However, we decided to confine basically the analysis more on the publication records in terms of peer reviewed articles and all these old articles that are listed as press, published in press, but they are actually published in journals. So there are quite, uh, for sure, it can be extended to other type of documents and the picture can change, including per se, only the project deliverables, I believe that uh, at least the institutional setting would change. And in terms of the commercialization of mitigation, it's a fair consideration. I'm actually uh, not uh, able to answer properly if it really it is because of this reason or if because we are moving towards preparedness, building awareness, building resilience of societies instead. Uh, it's actually quite struggling. It was struggling to answer seeing how the keyword decision making was uh, presenting a dramatic spike which means that a climate services move from a purely uh, service, again, uh, capable of really understanding future climate towards a tool that can be used for preparedness and for uh, building resilience. So I believe that that would be perhaps mostly the driver, but we definitely need uh, still to check if this is the case. Okay, thank you. Uh... Two, two very little questions uh, you can answer quickly. Uh, one question was uh, if you consider the only English uh, article written in English, I suppose so. Yes. Okay. Yes, and uh, another question uh, by Roger Street is uh, also I can answer for you uh, that are there any plans for publishing this work as far as yes. you know? Yes. 
Yeah. Yes, <laughs> actually a lot. And uh, and uh, the idea is since that we're using even the code um, written in R, which is this uh, open source software, also ideally, uh, of course, depending on the publication, uh, also the code will be available. I would love people to replicate uh, the same. And, and sorry for the English speaking, uh, English speaking articles. Yes, we're considering only the English, but I must say that the amount of articles written in other languages is not that mm, huge compared to the publication and the peer reviewed article that uh, are written and published in English. Okay, then there is a, a question about the increase of the interest on the camera services because we say that I also personally say that there is an increasing interest, but but from your figures, uh, Stefano Tibaldi, I don't know the institution, I don't see, uh, ask Same is. Um, yeah, I remember, I, I suspected so, but I wasn't sure. So please indicate always your institution and, and country. Uh, Stefano is arguing if 12% uh, of uh, um, paper increase is really an, a significant increase in uh, 35 years. But I, well, I, I saw yeah. this uh, exponential increase, so I don't know if... I don't know if I can come back, for, sorry, yeah. to the point, so to show you. Yes, uh, I guess that you are mentioning this um, figure. Well, from 1980. Ah, yeah. yeah, this is annual growth rate. So it's not 12% since 1988. No, it's 12 yeah. annual growth rate. But I think that what is mostly important is not the period 1980, let's say 2001, because still not so much is happening at this moment. But then from 2001, which is the definition of climate services, uh, by the atmospheric board and specifically from 2009 which is the uh, creation of the global framework for climate services actually i believe that is quite uh, that uh, the curve is quite steep then still perhaps there are sectors which are showing a greater uh, fair amount of uh, articles published more but uh, still uh, this is a broad concept so you must uh, you must bear in mind that here everything can potentially uh, enter in terms of users, sectors, and also expertise. So 12% uh, annual growth rate is not, I believe it's fair. Yeah, but I think uh, it is annual. So it is I, I, it is good, I think it is a, quite a good increase. And uh, I have a question from Denis Sonwa from Cameroon. And uh, he is asking that, uh, um, uh, okay, it's a consideration that it, uh, a good multidisciplinary and multi-institutional, uh, multidisciplinary and multi-institutionality sorry, is needed to respond to climate change. Uh, what is the evolution toward a more balance between the disciplines in your study? Well, still, in terms of disciplines, I haven't shown it uh, for, again, time purposes, but in terms of discipline, the discipline that is still dominant is Earth and Planetary Sciences. And here I'm using basically the distinction that is done directly from Scopus. 65% uh, of all articles are falling, according to Scopus, into this category, uh, they're followed by environmental science and social sciences in general. Uh, that Definitely a multidisciplinary approach is something that is uh, very well accepted at this stage, but uh, the analysis of the keywords is actually showing that uh, either, smooth, either slowly or fairly, or fairly quickly, depending on your personal uh, view, but we are moving there. Uh, so uh, we are going towards that direction of interdisciplinary approaches of multidisciplinary uh, research groups. So definitely, definitely your consideration is, uh, is, is also one of the research community that we are analyzing. Okay, then I have a long question from our CMCC colleague, Elisa Cagliari. Um, you really made a great job, okay. Uh, a curiosity, it is possible to connect all these different aspects um, through a casual relationship. For instance, this author published a lot because it comes from a certain university that is able to get most of certain sources of funding and so on. So let's say, saying that depending on some 
some specific reason that maybe there is uh, this um, Yes, uh, yeah. I see. I see the point because actually um, what we presented here is something that is in progress, but we performed recently uh, a preliminary stage regression. So using a multivariate regression analysis, we actually regressed against the number of published articles. So the dependent variable is number of published articles. We used all the statistics that we computed in the network analysis. And we found that the network, uh, the, 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 the value of between the centrality, so basically uh, the role of a given actor of being central in the information flow is the one that really has a huge impact on the number of publication records, more than the density, uh, definitely more than the density of the network itself. But the, the fact of being central in terms of connecting two dots so two notes is the one that is boosting the publication productivity. But definitely in the publication that we plan to publish, there will be a causal uh, relationship uh, through ideally this multi-regression analysis. Okay, thanks. Also you answered, uh, you fully answered to this question. And uh, I have another question that I, I think you more or less said, but just to clarify, Alberto by Alberto Toccoli. So he's wondering if uh, can we consider Tama services, um, how you consider the, 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 the publications before the Tama service was formally defined? Can we consider those articles considering Tama services? Well, um, the query that we launched in Scopus, and uh, I'm glad that at least we have this slide here, uh, was uh, quite um, long, fairly long. We checked with multiple uh, with multiple words, and uh, still they are falling, according to Scopus, into climate services. So we have like a, a number of publications of 1980, 1990, that are considered climate services and we didn't decide on our own, but it was the query basically that we did on Scopus that did the job. It's, it's true that before there was not a formal definition, but still I must say that the definition that is in place now and that was developed since 2001 is fairly broad, uh, which means that still, even though there is a definition, many different things can fall in the category of climate services and Scopus uh, does uh, quite a fair job in, in really including all of them. Yeah, I think uh, this answer uh, answers also this other question by Adrian Perels. Mm -hmm. that says that uh, what kind of uh, search terms did you use besides camera services uh, uh, because uh, this the term camera services is not always appreciated uh, mm -hmm. and may also denote different things uh, any idea about uh, uh, the amount of publication which uh, uh, with camera services relevance without using the this term and uh, francesca mm -hmm. maybe try to answer this question briefly so we we come to the end super quickly uh, we uh, cross-checked uh, several ways of writing climate services so plural singular capital letters small letters uh, all together and then we we decided the first to look for weather and climate services weather services or all of them all combined if we look for weather services for example there are 14,000, more than 14,000 publication records. But weather services have a longer history of time. So we chose to focus only on the combination of capital and plural singular letters yes, on climate services. It is an interesting point. We could definitely look at how the picture changes uh, looking at several combinations. But I can tell you that uh, uh, looking also at the keywords, climate services themselves are one of the top uh, keywords uh, in the first 50 keywords that are mentioned in the abstract. So it's true that uh, there are different ways of calling them, but uh, it was the decision that we made at the very beginning. Okay, I think it is worthwhile to ask you one last question by Euberto Likayan. Uh, how can information and communication technologies work fast and successfully in addressing climate change impact risks? Uh, well, if we focus, for example, on innovation here, looking at climate services, the fact that the network is not very cohesive, 
uh, allows for more heterogeneity, for innovation to pop up. In, in a way that uh, there are different expertises, different disciplines, they're all combined together, they try to mix and match, and this is really boosting like the publication, the, the, the content of publication records in our sample. However, of course, if multidisciplinary uh, teams are pulled together and they are pushing the boundaries of research ahead, that would facilitate the information flow across Europe and around, uh, across the world. So it would be definitely an advantage in general, not just looking at climate services themselves, but uh, definitely multidisciplinary research groups could foster uh, this information flow and could allow for research to be really effective in the fight against climate change. Okay, Francesca, so uh, um, do you have any closing remarks? Send me your feedbacks and your, uh, your, your suggestions. I'm really, we're really open to your, really to your suggestions and uh, hopefully that I didn't use too much my hands, but uh, otherwise, sorry, I'm Italian. So yeah, thank you. Okay, so I, uh, this interesting webinar that raised the, a big interest, as I saw from the question, is coming to the end now. Uh, but before to close it, I would invite you to join our next webinar, our next CBCC webinar, that is Water Management, Innovative Ways to Assess Precipitation Spatial Distribution, presented by Paola Masson from the CBCC uh, Division on Ocean Prediction and Applications. And so now I can really close. I really thank you, you all for your participation. And of course, I thank Melly Francesca for your presentation and also Alessandra Mazzaida uh, for the organization that uh, she supported us. Um, and I'm pleased, uh, I'm pleased to inform you that this webinar was recorded and uh, will be uploaded uh, uh, on uh, the WHMCC website. So you can uh, try to look uh, for it. And uh, of course, if you have any questions about the webinar, you can use uh, this general email, but you also have seen the Francesca email. So please feel free to write us uh, any, any email uh, to further uh, address this uh, interesting and uh, uh, yes, interesting topic. Okay, so thank you very much. For me, we can close. Thank you. Bye-bye.